We are very privileged tonight uh, to be able to hear a lecture from Father Robert Gall, who is the Associate Professor of Ethics at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. And he is sort of transferred more or less permanently across the pond, uh, but nevertheless uh, is a native of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, was uh, actually got his first uh, degree in chemical engineering at Wash U, and then was transformed into a philosopher and moral theologian uh, upon his uh, en entrance into the uh, prelature of Opus Dei and his ordination thereon. And he is uh, um, published in the area of ethics, uh, both in the, the sort of academic and scholarly area, but also in the uh, popular area as well. And uh, you will not uh, um, wonder at uh, his ability to negotiate these two realms after you've heard him speak tonight. So let us welcome Father Robert Gall. After that, after that introduction, it's going to be especially challenging to try to negotiate those two realms because uh, I have, uh, maybe it's my major defect, I'm not sure, is that I bite off more than I can chew, uh, maybe at the dinner table, but also with uh, setting up these topics and titles for the, the presentation, like uh, the, the topic that we have tonight, which is Voitiwa. Carl Wojtyla on kingship and morality, Thomistic implications. And as I developed this paper, I couldn't help but incorporate things of my research having to do with Francisco de, de Vitoria. Uh, and I hope that those, the, the piece of my paper about Vitoria is not simply a distraction. The main, my main thesis is very simple. My main thesis in this presentation is that Carl Wojtyla held deeply and asserted so most explicitly in his book, The Sources of Renewal, that the whole of morality, whether natural or supernatural, meaning whether in philosophy or in theology, the whole of morality can be understood as kingship. And you may, well, what, well, what is that all about? Is that I have to uh, bend down before some king? Who is that guy? Well, of course, uh, Karl Wojtyla, John Paul II would say we, do, we should bend down before some guy. <laughs> and that some guy is God himself, and he's Jesus, who is the king. But more deeply and more basically, Karl Wojtyla meant that to act rightly and to live in a way that is successful and flourishing and makes us happy requires exercising self-dominion which is a kind of kingship or governance over ourselves, and to exercise such kingship and governance also over others. So who are those others? Well, it depends upon your role in life. If you're a mother of a family and you have children, it entails ruling the household and ruling your children. If you have some role in the professional world, which involves directing other people or teaching other people, I get it, and that too is an opportunity for kingship. But, and this is just um, to, get, to get the central, the the central thesis straight. From the perspective of supernature, of theology, and of grace, kingship is very much the call of all Christians on account of our baptismal vocation. And our baptismal vo vocation requires from us not just worshiping Jesus as king, but exercising his dominion by being other Christs in our own personal lives. So that's the overall challenge that I'd like to propose in this talk. And I left this picture up from the previous presentation, and this is a picture of a painting which is in my university. Of course, it's the Blessed Virgin Mary with baby Jesus standing on her knee there, and that's St. Peter on her left with the keys, and St. Paul on her right, and it's a fresco that was painted by an unknown author, so we don't know who he was, in the late 15th century. <clears throat> in the chapel, in the entrance to the chapel of my university, which is the basilica, was built around this painting. So every day I can go and pray before this. So she uh, will uh, give me uh, strength as I try to uh, explain this topic. 
Blessed John Paul II oversaw the drafting and then approved the publication of the new 1983, now not so new, but Code of Canon Law, which was designed to guarantee the legal implementation of the principles taught in Vatican II. One of the canons tells us that the Christian faithful are those who, inasmuch as they have been incorporated in Christ through baptism, have been constituted as the people of God. For this reason, made sharers in their own way in Christ's priestly, prophetic, and royal function, they are called to exercise the mission which God has entrusted to the church to fulfill in the world in accord with the condition proper to each. While much of canon law probably strikes us Americans as foreign, if not in conflict with our p political culture, but this just mentioned quotation from canon law probably should strike us as particularly strange, especially in its reference to the royal function. <clears throat> the Latin, the original Latin for the term is munus regalis. If regalis had been translated as regal instead of royal, perhaps this legal mandate would seem all the stranger to our egalitarian ears. Despite the fact that today we celebrate the memorial of St. Louis, at least as an optional mo memorial, the king of France, so a king who became saint. Notwithstanding the unusual sound of words like kingship and regality, we should take very seriously <coughs> the fullness of our Christian vocation according to what's called the tria munera, which is the triple office, the triple mission, the triple function, so central to the conciliar teachings of Vatican II. And in particular, the emphasis upon the kingship in Christ to which all are called. Recently, while quoting from Vatican II, Pope Benedict declared, the laity, by their very vocation, seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and by ordering them according to the plan of God. They generously dedicate themselves wholly to the advancement of the kingdom of God and to the reform and improvement of the temporal order in a Christian spirit. Then Pope Benedict said, and this is all really quoting from Vatican II, it is their special task, so of the lay faithful, <clears throat> to order and to throw light upon these affairs in such a way that they may come into being and then continually increase according to Christ, to the praise of the Creator and the Redeemer. Well, these temporal affairs, as, we'll see, as we will see, are in first place our very selves, well, maybe I should say your very selves, because I and a couple of the other people here are clerics, and there are a few consecrated persons here also in the religious life. But for the lay faithful, it is your very self which the Pope is speaking about in first place. To exercise a royal function is nothing less than to rule, to exercise governance by directing a community to its common good. <clears throat> and as Christians, our call is to govern in Christ, with him, and through him, to establish his kingdom here on earth. Well, in this presentation, I will briefly trace some of the salient Thomistic moments in the history of the development of kingship in order to indicate the implications for what can be referred to as Wojtyla's politically subversive yet theologically traditional call to a universal kingship. And yes, you and I, are, all of us, are called to be kings or queens. And I say that what Wojtyla did was subversive. We should also think of the political, political scenario in which he acted, <clears throat> especially as Archbishop of Krakow under the Soviet dominion of Poland. Aquinas, first of all, Aquinas on original sin and the so-called fundamental option. For Aquinas, the exercise of governance or dominion, that is to rule, entails power, but it's not just power. To govern is to authoritatively direct towards an end, to order that which is good to that for which all things have their being. Of course, only the creator can rule in the full sense. He establishes the order intrinsic in all that is by bringing, bringing creatures into being from nothing. Moreover, God eternally continues his governance by means of his providence, which achieves its full perfection only in the reward <coughs> and punishment granted in the just exchange for the free behavior of his rational creatures. The rational creatures order themselves through choice. In Aquinas' careful formulation, 
Ewing talks about ea que sunt ad finem in Latin, which are those things that are for the sake of the end. These are the means. They are freely ordered by angels and by us humans in their and our participation in God's governance. Just to uh, sort of give an example of how this can come to bear in our own personal life. If after a long drought it begins to rain, like it did last night, we can give thanks to God and even order this beauty in creation to God, which is exercising not just this regal function of ordering things to their end by glorifying God through the rain that produces fecundity in nature, but also by worship him, by in worshiping him, by glorifying him. But when we see beauty in, in nature and in his creation, it's actually, strictly speaking, also the priestly function, not just regal, but priestly, what would be called the common priesthood or the royal priesthood that's common to all of the baptized faithful. Well, to act reasonably with understanding and willfulness is to see order, to see the point. Well, why are you doing that? What's that for? It's to order things to an end. And if we order things to an end, it's because we see that end as somehow better than the things that are for the sake of the end. This should always happen with persons. And in persons, we should see we should love them for themselves, which is to order everything to them. Human freedom consists in this self-dominion by which we knowingly direct ourselves towards the due end. The full field for the exercise of freedom includes directing oneself along with the whole of society towards the end. That's why the ancients would say that only the king fully exercises the virtue of prudence because only the king directs not just himself and his house, but the whole of society. For Aquinas, freedom entails governance of self and of the polity. Freedom grounds the human right to govern insofar as it specifies that which is necessary for human perfection and consequently that which one deserves in accordance with his natural end. So freedom is a basis for our right and our duty to govern over ourselves and, and others. Well, because of original sin, there's a big problem with original sin regarding freedom. Because of the effects of original sin, it's a big problem for Aquinas. <clears throat> On account of original sin, the human being was demoted from his previous dignity. And in consequence, every human being, every child of Adam and Eve, with just two exceptions, are, we're all, we've all been conceived in sin. <coughs> of course, the two exceptions are Jesus and Mary. The effects of original sin include the punishment of the, what's called the foams of sin or the disorder of sin. And this punishment is a, is a disorder in our natural inclination towards the goods that causes us, for instance, thank you. It causes us, for instance, to want to drink and eat too much. Maybe not drink too much water, but uh, maybe eat too many chocolate chip cookies. Those are the foams of sin, this disorder within us. This disorder in our nature that's caused by original sin is even greater than just this attraction towards the goods in an, exor in a, in an exaggerated way of concupiscence. Because we were, instead of being born and conceived with a, an inclination towards the fullness of goodness, our original conception, the beginning of our lives, is one of selfishness. And you who have children, uh, babies, infants, probably see that when they're very young, they're not thinking about the others. They're thinking about themselves all the time. And... <laughs> if they're hungry or if they're thirsty or if their stomach's upset or if their mommy has left them for a moment and they're always thinking about themselves, it seems. In fact, they don't, it takes them a while to even discover that there are others. <clears throat> so the beginning of our lives is one in selfishness. Rather than loving the good, God himself even, which should be proper to our nature because he is a supreme good, if our nature were whole and unblemished by sin, we begin instead from the, from the posture of selfishness. There's another exception with respect to birth. There's a third person who was born without sin, probably. I think it's common teaching by theologians, who is St. John the Baptist, that he was probably 
gifted with sanctifying grace at the moment of the visitation when he leapt in the womb of his, mo of his mother, St. Elizabeth. <clears throat> well, this selfishness of our first parents and their sin taints us all through a kind of primordial misdirection, which is nothing less than an impediment to our rationality and freedom. Rather than being inclined to the ordering of all things to the due end, we begin by wanting it all for ourselves, which is really inherently irrational because we are not the end of all things, nor are we the end of ourselves. In fact, if we're all alone and just have everything to ourselves, I don't think any of us would be very happy. Instead, we need to have people to live for and to give things to <clears throat> in order to be happy. Well, the political implications of original sin are immense, even if they're not so evident at first. If human reason is so wounded by original sin that humans are conceived without their being rationally ordered to their end, then how can they rationally order others towards theirs? So how can you govern if you can't govern yourself? Without self-dominion, how can one even begin to aspire to political dominion? For Aquinas, the solution was deceptively simple, yet profound so profound that it's been overlooked, even by some of his most careful students. In the last article of his Treatise on Sin, which is in the first part of the second part, in Question 89, Article 6, he states that if the unbaptized child does that which he is able by nature, and consequently upon achieving the use of reason, <coughs> orders himself and everything else towards the due final end, then original sin is remitted from him. And moreover, God will, convert the, God will convert to the poor, the God comes to the child as the child converts to God. That's the way St. Thomas Aquinas puts it in that question 89, article 6, so the first part of the second part. To put it in other terms, by exercising his natural reasoning power in his ability to participate in God's governance and thereby order all things toward their end, the child not only corrects the defect due to original sin, but also through conversion, opens himself to the gratuitous divine forgiveness of sin and the sanctifying power of grace. The child passes from the state of being a son of ire or wrath to being a son of God, a son or daughter of God in the divine son by adoption in Christ. If, on the other hand, Aquinas says, the child were to fail to act according to his power of reason as soon as he can, and the Latin there is cito quam potest, for some reason, I, I think sounds wonderful. Maybe I have a colleague whose name is Chito. Chito quam potes, as soon as he can, if the child doesn't do so as soon as he can, to correct the deviation affected by the medicinal punishment original sin, then he will have committed a personal mortal sin. So if a child doesn't turn to God as soon as he can, that would be a grave sin. This, thus, according to Aquinas, the natural human power to govern has been lost on account of original sin. We're now destitute, removed from the princely power of kingship, and rendered servants. And yet all are called to recover through their own natural correspondence to the light of natural reason and the aid of the supernatural light of grace to recover the princely rule of rational participation in divine kingship. So our position as destitutes isn't definitive, but at any moment through conversion, we can come back to God and he's ready to offer us his mercy and his grace. So the next part of my paper is a really complicated part, which um, I'll skip over part of it. Well, uh, maybe I should skip over most of it. <laughs> <clears throat> and the really complicated part is about um, the discovery of America. And that's what makes things really complicated. Maybe living in Texas, we have kind of a special perspective on this discovery of America uh, because of the, well, the complex history of Texas and who was uh, responsible politically over the authority of Texas. But to put it briefly, this, the discovery of America was an earthquake for theology in Europe. Uh, it was a real earthquake because through the... Uh, through ancient times up until the early Middle Ages, it was a common conviction of theologians that the apostles had in fact successfully orally preached, so by speaking, to all the peoples on the earth. I think of the apostles orally preaching to all the peoples of the earth. You know, they didn't have microphones and loudspeakers back then. 
Uh, so and they didn't have the internet and blogs and all, <laughs> all that. Uh, I used to travel frequently to Malta, which is this island country in the Mediterranean just off of Sicily, uh, an amazing place. But one of the amazing things about Malta is that they are very proud of their Christian heritage, the people of Malta. They are convinced that the faith was brought to Malta by St. Paul. The national holiday of the, con the nation of Malta, any of you know what it is? It's St. <laughs> it's Paul's Shipwreck. And that's, that is the title of the national holiday. And the main, the main church, one of the main churches in, in Malta is the Shipwreck Church. It's because St. Paul landed in Malta on account of his shipwreck. And he was saved and, and dragged up on the beach. And he was all wet and freezing to death when they built that fire. And, and if you remember, the snake came out from the fire and bit him, a poisonous snake. And they said, this guy must be uh, possessed by a demon if he gets shipwrecked and then he gets bitten by a snake. Well, they're all very proud that they were evangelized <coughs> by St. Paul. There's another island in the nation of Malta. There's just two islands that are inhabited throughout the year, and the other one is called Gozo. Uh, it, well, the Gozatans, as they're called, they say, we heard St. Paul too, because we could hear him miraculously from across the channel that's about a mile and a half long. Well, it was the conviction that everyone virtually in the world had heard the apostles preach. And when America was discovered, millions of people were found in this faraway place, this great land, a whole hemisphere, who none of whom could have heard of Jesus, none of whom could have heard of baptism. So this created a theological problem, but it immediately led to a political problem because the king of Spain, <clears throat> sorry, the, the pope had given the king of Spain the authority to impose Spanish rule uh, upon the areas of conquest throughout America. Well, throughout most of America. There was also the special right that the Portuguese had. So what happened is there ensued a great theological debate that was part especially inflamed, the debate in, in Spain and in Salamanca, <coughs> and particularly among Dominicans. Francisco de Vitoria was one of these lead Dominicans in defending the rights of the Native Americans uh, against those Spaniards, who I think were a minority, actually, but who, were, who held that even without proclaiming the gospel in any way, given the fact that these Native Americans were not baptized and were not Christian, and, and thus they must be an original sin, was their claim, Thus, they can't govern themselves towards their due end. Thus, their political regime is invalid because they can't even govern themselves because they're in sin. So they can't, surely can't govern anyone else. So the competent regime here is the Spanish throne, the Spanish crown. So immediately, even with force, if necessary, impose it because the Pope has given us the bull of right to these lands and these people do not have dominion even over themselves. Francisco de Vitoria argued against this claim by making a move which he came to understand more and more didn't quite make sense. It's kind of a sad component of this story is that while Francisco de Vitoria was right in his conclusions in defending the Native Americans, he wasn't correct in his theological reasoning. And yet he did show himself to be a careful scholar and really a humble man because in giving his lectures, he rectified his position, but in rectifying his position, he promised to later clarify the premise of his argument. And it seemed that he kept getting into deeper and deeper trouble about uh, what he was claiming in his premise. So what was at stake and what was the problem regarding his premise? Well, in his premise, his claim was that the Native Americans upon what they called Indios, upon doing what they could according to their own nature could have received from God forgiveness of original sin and therefore be lifted from the state of wrath and thus be able to direct themselves towards their, their end. However, nonetheless, Vittoria said, given that they haven't received baptism at that point, they can't take part in sanctifying grace. And so what he was proposing was that these Indians, 
indios were justified and therefore no longer in sin, but neither were they in grace. So justification without sanctification. A few years later at the Council of Trent, that position was condemned, um, really because of, well, in part because of a reaction against Protestant theologies, which also led to a kind of separation between the justification proponent, pro component of grace and grace insofar as it is healing and elevating of the human being. And so it's, it's not um, pure coincidence that America was discovered and the Protestant Reformation occurred. There was probably theological undercurrents that were affecting some of the theological opinions that led to the, the um, formulation of the Protestant Reformation. In any case, Vittoria was convinced that the, the story is kind of fascinating from the perspective, I think, of a university professor because it seems to have been one of his students, in particular Melchor Cano is his name, also Dominican, who did take part in the Council of Trent. And it seems that the, the student of Francisco de Vittoria convinced Vittoria that this didn't make sense to separate out Jesus' forgiveness from Jesus' grace. Because if you hold this idea of a two-staged or two-tiered uh, kind of justification, it would mean that Jesus could forgive you, but then he wouldn't adopt you as a son of God. Whereas what the church has always taught is that those two go hand in hand. And that's why St. Thomas very carefully says that if you convert to God, God will convert to you. So you ask for, for forgiveness from God, and he adopts you as his son or as his daughter. And that's the traditional teaching of the church that, of course, is upheld and clarified at the Council of Trent. So again, Vittoria defended the rights of governance of the Native Americans, but he did so with this argument that was faulty from the get-go, even though he could have just relied upon that text in, of St. Thomas Aquinas in question 89.6, and if he had done so, I think the whole thing would have been straightened out, but unfortunately that text has been given, I think, um, has been neglected unduly throughout the centuries. So what's, what are the what are the political <coughs> impl implications? The political implications are, I mean, right away, responsibility to a divine vocation. Look, for instance, at the first chapter of Veritati Splendor, written by John Paul II, which asks, asks exactly this question, what must I do to have eternal life with that dialogue between Jesus, whom the rich young man has not yet recognized as the Lord? Well, to be in doubt... <laughs> To be endowed with responsibility for political governance is to be entrusted by divine providence with the task of ordering free men and women to their common good, all while exercising the virtue of prudence with the gift of counsel so as to discern what is most opportune in the present time and with the present conditions. So it requires prudent discernment. Such responsible governance requires creativity by discerning how to apply universal and permanent principles to the present situation. An example, parents who are considering what school to send their children to is uh, exactly they're exercising kingship over their family and governance, and they need to prudently discern as to what the circumstances are. While the local bishop can recommend the Catholic schools, I don't think he has the authority to order parents to send their children to one school or another because the parents themselves are directly invested from God with the power of governance over their families. In fact, this is something that Wojtyla emphasizes in the letter to families. So it's not a power that is delegated by the bishop to the lay faithful through some sort of devolution, which is what the term was used in the British politics. But instead it's through subsidiarity that in fact the parents are endowed with that power. This is all brought to bear by the Holy See, this is an aside, but brought to bear this special right that parents have, that they're invested with as parents. Uh, a few years ago, there was a controversy in a diocese, which I think was in the United States, but I'm not sure. The, the diocese wasn't mentioned in the formal published document, but it was over the right age of confirmation for a teenage girl. And the girl was seeking confirmation, her parents were seeking confirmation, and the sacrament was de denied of her by her, her parish in the diocese, saying that she wasn't old enough according to the diocesan rules. Well, after um, quite a complex kind of litigation to the Holy See on the part of this family, the Vatican 
came up with a decree to the bishop saying that it seemed that this girl had a right to the sacrament and that they ought to no longer to, de to deny the sacrament from her and that the diocese should inform the Vatican as to what they have done in order to resolve this situation and to uh, satisfy this legitimate right on the part of the, the faithful. And moreover, and this is the key par part in this letter written by the prefect of the Congregation for Sacraments and Divine Worship, they said, if there is any doubt as to whether or not she is sufficiently prepared to receive this sacrament, the first people who should be queried are her parents because they are the ones who have the responsibility for her formation. Well, this creativity of prudential governance is nothing but participation in and continuance of God's creative power. And of course, parents through the creative power through procreation by which they bring children into the world and not only bring them into the world, but then are tasked with this very special munus, which is prin principally this office of kingship in order not just to bring children into the world, but to bring them into heaven, into eternal life, which is the fullness or the completion of parenthood. Consequently, all the principles of social doctrine, especially those of subsidiarity and solidarity, are to be seen in the light of the universal call to kingship, the very foundation of all of morality and politics. Well, at this point, in a sense, I've concluded, but I've got a, like an, an, an annex to the, whole, to the whole paper, which, if you'll bear with me, it's, it'll take a couple minutes. And it's on Pope Benedict. And it's on Pope Benedict on love as a continuation of Wojtyla and kingship. I hope it's not too much. <clears throat> well, upon his election to the See of Peter, Benedict XVI dedicated his three, his three encyclicals that he's written so far to love, hope, and to social doctrine. Benedict draws from the magisterium of his blessed predecessor, John Paul II, and expands upon his teachings. In his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is Love, Pope Benedict argued that love is inherently expansive, ecstatic, and effusive. In his third and most recent encyclical, Caritas in Veritate, Charity in the Truth, Benedict addressed the current economic crisis by subverting and reversing the common understanding of economy as a parsimonious reduction in costs, or like if we talk about an economy car, or a miserly redistribution of resources. For our countercultural pope, economy is principally, <coughs> excuse me, it's principally a question of charity, of love. God challenges all human beings to collaborate with the Creator by not just conserving His creation, but improving and expanding upon all of creation. Therefore, we enjoy the right and duty to continue God's creative work. A good Christian, in particular, must strive to create wealth and to foster development, especially seeking to promote the integral development of the poorest. The first book of the Bible says that Adam and Eve were created to be fruitful and to multiply, to extend and to propagate the gifts received from God. Man and woman were created in God's image, and so they are to continue his work. Demographic growth and human fruitfulness, giving birth to offspring, and extending human life through the generations are components of the broader fruitfulness of expanding upon the vast wealth of the marvelous array of nature found in our planet and beyond. Well, Benedict's message is a continuation of John Paul II's revolutionary model of kingship. The Pope challenges the world to overcome the current economic crisis by transforming all human transactions in accord with love in truth. Human freedom, that is true kingship, requires overcoming the materialist tendency to see every transaction as a zero-sum game and transforming all that appears as mere transaction into a truly human relationship of reciprocity and even gift. In Love and Responsibility, Wojtyla emphasized the distinction between use and enjoyment, she called uti and frui, using the Latin, and forcefully argued for overcoming the reduction of human transactions, especially within marriage, to one of use, by achieving mutual enjoyment or fruition. Benedict challenges us to overcome the mere profit motive by focusing on how all human relationships, including those based on material transactions, offer an opportunity for gratuitous gift. Indeed, for Benedict, 
The market economy presupposes a cultural and ethical basis of responsibility, trust, and the readiness to give of oneself to others, and a love for the common good above all, the love of the common good <laughs> above and beyond one's own preferences. Pope Benedict even connects the market to Trinitarian theology. In a bold move, I think. The three divine persons are united in their love, and this divine love is the source and summit of human life. Most fundamentally, the market is driven by love, ultimately God's love for us and our love for God. Thus, life in Christ is the first and principal factor of development, the Pope says, which must be sought with the ardor of charity and the wisdom of truth. And in the, in the light of the revealed mystery of the Trinity, we understand that true openness does not mean loss of individual identity, but profound interpenetration. <clears throat> for the gratuitous gift of love to flourish in society, men and women must learn to love first in family life by experiencing the gratuitous and unconditional bonds of human relation within the spousal union and the bi-directional relationship of love between children and their parents. Husband and wife, mother and father, truly exercise kingship in the fecund governance of their family. The driving force behind human development is love, not of money, but of the human being. To consume more and more material things would never satisfy the deepest desires and most powerful longings of the human heart. Rather, what we really seek are loving relations with others. Self-gift, therefore, is the fundamental energy source for integral human development and the greatest treasure exchanged within human society. The kingly call explained by Wojtyła evokes a Polish play on words, often repeated by John Paul II. I hope to, re to, to pronounce it more or less right, but it's Dani Zadani, which is gift and task, gift and mission, gift and responsibility. In the theology of Vatican II, kingship is a munus, munus or zadani, all at once task, mission, gift, and calling. The rich meaning of the Polish word zadani was surely one of the reasons why John Paul II liked to repeat dani zadani, gift, mission. And he, <coughs> he viewed his, whole, his own life, his whole life and his vocation as dani zadani, as a gift and a mission. Well, we just the other day we celebrated Mary's queenship, John Paul II, was from, now from his heavenly perspective, must see her more and more as queen with her sweet rule over heaven and earth. Thank you very much. I look forward to the questions and discussion. <clears throat> I think that it was a very common view in the 16th century. Right. I think it was presupposed also by Francisco de Vitoria. I think, and, and therefore, in defending the Indios, the entire logic was they might be, they could be, and in a state of grace, and it's not my position to judge them. Whereas the, the other position wasn't simply that someone may have committed a sin or he seems to have committed a sin and therefore he's fallen out of grace, but that objectively and universally, it's impossible that they could be in the state of grace, and therefore certain that the whole society is not just disordered, but incapable of ordering itself. I think a, a crucial consideration is uh, do not judge or you will be judged. And we ought not to judge the individual conscience of someone being responsible for personal sin. Whereas, which is, of course, different uh, regarding the, the Christian who's under the rule of the sultan. How does he know that the sultan is personally responsible for not having been baptized? How does he know that he's in sin? And you don't. So you have to you give him the benefit of the doubt and you don't make that rash judgment that he may be, and, and this has been de further developed, in fact, in Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, I think it's 17, is where it talks about how there are other paths to grace and to belief that we can't exclude them from, from God. Now, but your question is, well, what about the view that was held back at that time? Um, well, regarding, you brought up a whole, a whole series of very interesting things that like also rendered to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Of course, the Christian is obligated to respect the authority that is, established. Now, unless he has, I mean, you'd ask, well, what if he had proof that everybody in that authority was simply wicked 
and disordered and had rejected with, through personal culpability their end. And I don't think anyone like ever posed that that was the case. They all saw some good and some competence in the established authority. Regarding rendering to Caesar that which is Caesar, rendering to God that which is God's, was um, it, the, there's a lot of biblical exegesis about the point that our Lord was making was also that Caesar was viewed as God and that uh, is Caesar really the God or shouldn't we be worshiping the one true God and not Caesar? Yes. The point that you were making, and I'm not sure whether you agree with it or not, uh, but I think it was Thomas, in terms of um, the child, insofar as the child turns toward God, God turns toward the child uh, and remits the sin if the child does not uh, exercise rationality at this point as much possible. But Presuming that the, the basis of this way of thinking is that uh, if we don't uh, work with nature with integrity, then there cannot be grace. But what happens, uh, to me this is very contradictory to, say, Augustine, who says everything is grace, and certainly what I've always understood in Christianity is God is the first initiator. God is the hound of heaven. God is the one who is always uh, first, best, greatest in terms of seeking us out and loving us. How do you put those two things together? Yeah. St. Thomas is real careful about distinguishing between nature and grace and holding that they're, they're not separate, but they're distinct. Of course, nature is given in creation and grace is a gratuitous gift on top of nature for our salvation. Then Aquinas too makes further distinctions between kinds of grace and when he's speaking about God coming to the child in that case and he's speaking about the child who hasn't been baptized so the child who is in original sin <clears throat> he's um, Aquinas is speaking about sanctifying grace which is habitually in the child after the child were to be sanctified and justified. And the two always go together in Catholic theology. Whereas I don't think Aquinas is there referring to whether or not, I think he'd say that there probably are other kinds of grace, but not habitual sanctifying grace, but actual graces. That also, as you mentioned, the hound, like the hound of heaven, that God is also helping and facilitating and drawing out, including the child who is born in the American hemisphere in the 13th century, by giving... <laughs> him graces so that the child can turn to God and then God gives him the habitual grace of sanctification. So I think Aquinas's model were also allows for that pursuit on the part of God in, in helping us even prior to becoming his children, while at the same time maintaining very strongly the distinction between that which is proper to nature and that which is proper to grace. Nonetheless, of course, the, I, I think, of course, the doctrine is that if of Aquinas that if one does what one can according to nature, and by nature we are ordered to love God above all things, and if you do that, well then he will reward you with grace. There's an issue here which stands out, which is like in parenthesis, which is the case of the children who die before they reach the age of reason. And therefore it's the issue of the limbo, not of the just, but of children, which has recently been ruled upon by Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith, that one need not hold Aquinas' position on that, basically what the congregation said. But Aquinas' position served also to defend the gratuitous character of grace. Whereas John Paul II liked to emphasize God's mercy, especially through the lens of the theology of the Jubilee, and therefore how God doesn't limit himself to the possibility of also offering this grace to a child who has no personal sin and has died before reaching the age of reason, before being baptized. In particular, John Paul II speaks about this in the encyclical, The Gospel of Life, and speaks about women who have had an abortion and how they can be consoled by the hope that their children intercede for them before the face of God from heaven. 
Dr. Summers? The point about what Dr. Martin was saying, isn't there a point in the, in the late 16th or early 17th century that the Pope releases the subjects, the Catholic subjects, from fealty to Elizabeth precisely because she's a heretic? So I think that's the same kind of thing that Victoria is, is talking about. That, that yes, authority requires grace. I mean, that, that seems to be the, you know, the, the notion. And, and for Aquinas, heresy is a particularly grievous yeah, kind of sin because it's one who, having been raised in the faith, having teaches the faith, and has been baptized, nonetheless rejects it somehow. And in this case, through excommunication, heresy. What I really wanted to ask you was about this, this very interesting idea of our kingship. Which of course is something we hear but don't kind of take in because kingship is a strange notion, as you as you mentioned. But if you contrasted it with Kant, who says because we are rationally free, we are autonomous, with Aquinas, who says because we're rationally free, we're kings. Uh, that's a, those are two very different positions, even though they might sound the same. But we, Absolutely. Especially when the model for kingship is Jesus, and it's also Jesus on the cross is where he manifests, especially his kingship and his rule, and giving his life for others who are really his children, which he gives birth to them from the cross. And therefore, rather than autonomy, you have what McIntyre calls the virtues of acknowledged dependence, which are very much familial, and in fact, monarchy is tended to be transmitted in hereditary fashion. So this is where I see that this subverting from above and below by Boitiwa is actually amazingly current and that it's fully applicable to democratic forms of government through the Constitution, through the principles that are laid forth in the Constitution, and we all participate in the governance of our polity through the democratic process. And therefore, of course, for Boitiwa, an important feature of the responsibilities of a Christian is participating in civil affairs in a way that's responsible. Appreciate that, Father. Uh, first thing, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, secondly, uh, referring to the Native American thing you said about how uh, the church believed that the apostles had reached everybody on earth and they, they discovered the Native American that they found out that there wasn't. Uh, the religion had its friend to the Native Americans. Is, is that indifferent to reason and to say that they felt that because they they didn't have the, they had original sin and that they were unable to said they were unable to be kings or to govern themselves? Right. Was that indifferent to reason? Did they believe that they just weren't able to reason? Because I believe I mean yeah. I yeah. personally believe that that's right. a lot involved into being a king or you know right. just properly reason really have use of reason in a technical sense is to be able to put things in order. In order not just to a proximate end, but to an end out there. So like a little kid who goes after the cookie jar, that's not really use of reason in the full sense because it's not ordering the whole life towards an end. But use of reason is putting everything ordered up towards a final goal, something higher than oneself. And so if one were to do that, and this is the idea regarding the Indios, if they were to, to have done that, to order themselves towards something higher than themselves, that would constitute self-governance and reason, and it would also, on Aquinas' terms, free them from original sin. No, no, that they, well, so for Aquinas, they, if they acted according to their nature, and in fact, in developing the use of reason, at some point did turn their lives towards God as, I use the term remunerator, somebody, someone who, re, who will reward you for your good deeds. And they live for him, like they live for God as the supreme good, that then they would be freed from original sin through the merits of Jesus. That's, that's the view of Aquinas. But there were people who were fighting Vittoria saying, no, no, they, don't, they can't do that and they can't actually receive grace. So they don't have self-governance. So they can't govern their own society. Well, not that they can do it on their own. Of course, it's a gift from God to be able to be, have original sin rem 
remitted from them. But yes, yes, but it, he certainly allows for that possibility, right? He doesn't judge anyone in particular <laughs> whether or not they do it or should. Yes, sir. To your knowledge, Father, does the appearance of Our Lady of Guadalupe, followed by a version of some 10 million of the natives, have any impact on this whole discussion of their state? Well, the the, the discovery, well, our, our, not the discovery, but the the apparition and the miracle of Our Lady of Guadalupe is just a, an amazing event in world history and salvation history, and it has a bunch of implications. I think just simply the, the most direct and simple one is that it also manifests a kind of readiness on the part of the indigenous population to to receive redemption. Um, it has tremendous implications for what's called enculturation, where it seems that Our Lady herself is like the icon and the model, the paradigm of enculturation. Even, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but the relationship between the way she appeared and some of the, the common themes in the pagan religion that many of the people had regarding overcoming the serpent, for instance, was also this kind of preparation for the redemption through Mary. So... But I, that, that's all I can. It seems to indicate that there was a, a readiness on part of the population, which does certainly is a kind of confirmation of the capability for us, of course, with the help of grace, but also relying upon our nature to turn towards God and to receive His redemption and salvation. Any other question? Maybe we should we just have one more? Is there one one more? Maybe. Yes. This, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, actually, I'm really happy you asked the question. I'll try not to be too long, but it has to do with something that I was, tr I was trying to find a way to sneak in during my talk, but I was, and it's my, one of my favorite examples, and it's the pink lemonade example. Uh, <laughs> pink lemonade. Uh, I was biking uh, in Cape Cod uh, right around the time when it was right after Caritas and Veritate came out. It was a beautiful bike path uh, on an old railroad uh, right of way. A really hot day, a lot of families out, beautiful day. And it would open up the, the trees along the bike path, and it would open up, and you'd see the ocean. You see Martha's Vineyard out there and all kinds of beautiful stuff. But a really hot day and a nice day. Uh, and one of these little openings, there were two little girls who had a pink lemonade stand. Well, I like pink lemonade, as you can tell. But moreover, what I really liked about this is it said, there was a big sign, and it said, free. Free pink lemonade. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a free lemonade stand, but it was free. Uh, and so we, I was with some friends, and we had a, we asked for a free pink lemonade, and it was great. And we drank, it, but it, we were really hot. We, Can I have another one? I said, sure. I said it's free. But they had a little sign that said, "Tips are welcome." <laughs> <laughs> and I bet they were making a lot more money <laughs> through their tips than if they were selling the pink lemonade, because if you sell it, you put a specific price on it, it becomes simply transactional. Whereas this was grif gift, and it was gratuity. And it was clearly not simply something material in the transaction. People were recognizing one another as human beings. This is also related to, I think, fascinating themes having to do with what's called the free software movement, which has all kinds of complexities that I ought not to go into. But <laughs> the free software movement, some, let, let's just take it for a simpler example. Some people say that if you take out all the pornography, which sadly is a huge quantity of what's available on the internet, they say the rest, 80% of it, is love. And what they mean by that is who puts all that material out there and why do they put all that material out there? And it's all really put out there because people want to share good things with other people whom they love. 
somehow they may not even know them, but they want to share all these good things with all these other people. And probably a lot of the websites that a lot of us frequent are really fundamentally put together out of love. So what Pope Benedict is saying is that the economy cannot be sustained on the basis of mere material transactions or consumerism. He's also saying that the free market economy is necessary, but the free market economy is based upon certain moral and anthropological principles of recognizing one another and especially common good and doing good things for other people. If we didn't respect our promises and our contracts, there wouldn't be a financial market. Um, then he takes that one step further in saying that we ought to seek, and this is really humanly perfective, that in every one of our transactions, even if it has a material basis component like the pink lemonade, that we also add some element of gift. And it might be simply smiling at the person or asking their name or recognizing them somehow as a human being, or it could be the opportunity of going much beyond that. So, of course, he's saying that we human beings are not just consumers, we're not just material beings, but we're spiritual and we're called to love. I think that's a good way to end, right? <laughs> Thank you, all of you. <laughs>